Hey everybody, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, I hate to be the guy to um, have to stop the music. Uh, I was really loving that playlist, but um, it's uh, about seven o'clock. So I think we should get the program started. I'm David Politzer. I'm the director of the School of Art at the University of Houston. And I wanna give everybody a warm welcome to the second event in our fall speaker series, a lecture and conversation with design activist Dee Nichols. At last week's event, the first in the series, I spoke about how attending events like this through our screens is different. I acknowledge that one benefit of that difference was that like tonight, we're streaming on Facebook and YouTube. This allows us to bring these speakers to a wider audience and welcome the world into the School of Art community here at the University of Houston. And I'm happy to report that last week we had viewers from all over the country, from Jersey City to South Bend, from DC to Sedona, LA, Philly, Eugene, Oregon. We even had somebody, uh, an attendee from Qatar in the Middle East. So if you would right now, if you take a minute to use the chat box, and let us know where you're beaming in from. We'd love to know who you are and where you are. I'm super excited for the series this year. Uh, we've lined up a stellar group of visitors. One week ago tonight was, uh, we hosted writer and critic Aruna D'Souza. Tonight we hear from Dee Nichols. And next month we welcome artist Nicholas Gallinin on October 15th and artist Derek Adams on October 22nd. I invite you to check the events page on the School of Art website for more information. That's where you're gonna find all the links you need to connect to the future talks. And hopefully you'll see that appear in the chat, a link to that site. A few notes about how tonight is gonna to run before we get going. First, um, we're recording the talk and it will be available soon on our YouTube and Vimeo channels. So check back for that. Next, this is a webinar, which is different from the regular Zoom meetings you may be accustomed to. The first thing you'll notice is that down here, you don't have all the buttons that you normally do. Um, you've probably noticed that for now, everyone is muted and, um, and you don't have the buttons. Uh, you do have the chat and the Q&A boxes, and we encourage you to use those both enthusiastically during the talk. For the Q&A, uh, when Dee is done with her uh, initial lecture, if you'd like to ask a question live, use the raise hand button, and I'll invite you to unmute your mic so you can speak your question. Uh, we'll also monitor the Q&A box, and if you want to just type your question, we'll be happy to read it aloud for you. <clears throat> the one caveat to all this is that if you're using an older version of Zoom, you may not be able to raise your hand or join with your voice. If that's the case, just type your question in, in the Q&A box and we'll read it for you. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Beckham Dossett, Associate Dean of the McGovern College of the Arts and Associate Professor of Graphic Design in the School of Art, Beckham. Thanks, David, uh, and thanks to everyone who's come out tonight. Uh, it's great to see you, sort of. I can see your names in the attendee list, and that's wonderful. Um, I'm glad you've come to hear Dee Nichols tonight. I think you're going to really like it. And if you arrived early, um, you got to hang out in the waiting room and listen to a part of a playlist that uh, Dee recommended to us. It's hers. It's called Design With By jo For Joy. And the title and the music speak to Dee's abundant and positive energy, um, a force that not only propels Dee to continually connect and initiate projects with others, but drives her belief that artists and designers can leverage their creative powers to address social, social justice in imaginative ways. Dee Nichols is a designer, activist, social entrepreneur, and lecturer addressing racial inequities within the built environment through the production of 
interactive art experiences, digital media, and social interventions. Dee is a 2020 Transnational Fellow with Monument Lab and serves as the principal of design and social practice at Civic Creatives in St. Louis, Missouri. Through multimedia artwork and lectures, she has championed the power of design and storytelling to inspire and equip ch change makers to protest social injustices and design civic solutions for progressive change across American communities. Her efforts as an arts organizer in the 2014 Ferguson Uprising catapulted her to international spotlight as artworks such as the mirror casket from 2014 were collected by the Smithsonian Institute. Since 2011, Dee has been deemed as a National Ideas That Matter recipient, a two-time Clinton Global Initiative innovator, and a St. Louis visionary recipient for her community impact in the arts. Dee holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Communications Design from Washington University in St. Louis, and earned her Master of Social Work specialization in social entrepreneurship from its Brown School of Social Work. She additionally is a Loeb Fellow of Harvard University's Graduate School of Design, Citizen Artist Fellow of the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, and a 2018 Artist Fellow with the Regional Arts Commission in St. Louis in Missouri. And we're very happy to have her here tonight. And with that, I turn it over to Dee. Welcome to the University of Houston. Thank you so much, Beckham. I really appreciate the introduction. And David, oh my gosh, that song, optimistic, uh, definitely it expresses my, you know, my my internal energy, uh, especially as this world right now is feeling so much pain. I listen to that track every day, um, and yeah, kind of got choked up while listening because. My goodness, that's where my spirit is. I wanna thank you all for welcoming me to uh, be here with you tonight, vir even though virtually. Uh, I definitely echo uh, David's sentiment that if we were in person, you would see me as a ball of energy. But right now, you're gonna see me on the screen and we're gonna make this as lively as it can be. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna delay. I'm, I'm gonna jump right into it. Uh, as a, an artist, as a designer, uh, as a lecturer, I, I get welcomed to a lot of communities to talk about the power of art to make change. And um, I, I think that these works that I'll share with you tonight are uh, quite relevant to what our nation is facing and perhaps to you uh, all who are artists, may be a source of inspiration for the ways in which you could uh, raise your voice and find solidarity with others during this time. So I, I'm someone who um, is considered as a multi-hyphenate person, uh, but tonight I'm gonna speak to you from the lens of being an artivist, uh, an artist activist. And uh, so much of my journey is based upon being down South and being raised in rural Mississippi. Uh, the two homes that you see on your screen are two that I grew up in, uh, in Cleveland, Mississippi, which is a town that until about 2009 was still uh, racially segregated by a railroad track, dividing the town east to west. Uh, as a kid, my family um, lived on the east side, but because I was uh, gifted, tested as a gifted student, I went to school at, on the west side uh, and of course took advantage of all of the privileges there, but faced so much uh, division and so much bullying because of uh, my race in that particular school and program. And later when I uh, decided to move to St. Louis uh, to study communications uh, design at Wash U, I started to see a lot of uh, resemblances in the division that was so ingrained in the culture and the city and the ways of navigating St. Louis. Uh, in many ways, Cleveland was a microcosm of what I would see and experience there. Uh, and because of these, these pivotal moments and pivotal spaces in my uh, journey, Addressing division and disparity and injustice became not just a mission for my life, but it, it became an imperative. It became as, as crucial and necessary as breathing itself. And 
as someone who had been always in the arts and nurtured towards visual art in particular, uh, I started to use art and design as not only my, my methods, my catalysts, my tools for uh, expressing myself about these, these issues, but it became my visual voice. And uh, I wanna share a little bit of that with you tonight. So I'll start with one of the first and earliest projects that I was a part of uh, in rural Alabama, coming straight out of undergrad. I was very inspired by a woman who at that time lived in uh, South Carolina and had started this initiative called Project H. She now lives in uh, the Bay Area in Berkeley, running a, another effort that she started called Girls Garage. And both of these efforts use the power and the ingenuity of young people, young minds, children, teenagers, and college students in order to identify issues within the physical realm of uh, a community, a town, a school, and teach them the tools in order to uh, make a change and build a structure that can address those issues. As a young designer coming fresh out of undergrad, I joined a similar issue, uh, a similar initiative in rural Alabama called Project M. And as you can see, I was the only person of color on my team during that time. And uh, we endeavored to use a lot of that same methodology to uh, teach young people skills, find and identify uh, voids within the physical spaces of, of the town uh, that we were in, which was Greens Greensboro. Uh, and build beautiful things out of discarded materials, especially those that had been destroyed or discarded because of a series of tornadoes that had flattened most of Hale County in that year of 2011. We thought that we were onto something. Uh, our intentions in, in many ways were, were I, I wouldn't say pure, but they, they were, we were well intended. Um, but during one of our installations of some of these basketball backboards and other park equipment that we uh, were installing and building, uh, we actually got kicked out of a neighborhood, uh, out of the park from a, a resident who came in on his pick pickup truck and told us you know, to get out, he cursed us out. Uh, but as the only black person on the team, he was a black person and looked at me and said, you should know better. And I share that story, this story, because in many ways, this became the foundation of so much of my work that I do now. Uh, learning how to work with community and not just parachute in, uh, but really co-design solutions and co-create uh, our, our collective voice in a way that uh, actually enlivens uh, people's livelihoods and, and well-being and not suppress their ideas of what they want their community to be and have. So once I went back to grad school, this became my focus. Uh, as with starting a, a nonprofit during my uh, tenure with studying social entrepreneurship, this notion of common cultural denominators became critical to the ways in which I wanted to work. There were two things at play. I wanted to make sure that I was always invited into communities uh, in order to co-create works. And I wanted to make sure that in the midst of that, we were finding these cultural universals that affect all of us in order to find common ground and design, use that as our catalyst to, to start. Now, some of these cultural universals are everyday things, recognizing that everybody is aging. And so we can use the process of aging as a jumping point for thinking about uh, elder care or thinking about the ways in which we uh, navigate our spaces or think about accessibility. Uh, everyone has to eat, so how might food become a catalyst? Everyone has a story, so how might story become the foundation uh, and how might we create, use the, the data that is intrinsic within stories in order to create something altogether new within our, our, our towns and our communities. Today though, I wanna to talk to you about not any of those, uh, but public space, this particular one. Because with the intersection of activism, the built environment in public spaces become so crucial to how we can understand uh, our opportunity for affecting change. And this has been so core to my life uh, in these past few years because there are so many spaces where uh, people have been displaced, people have been uh, targeted with harm, and our spatial grounds have become so politicized that 
we can start to wrestle with really big ideas through being in public space on the streets. In, in many ways with works like this, um, my practice is about paying attention and pointing out where those gaps, where those voids and where those injustices take place. Uh, sometimes it's in uh, you know, the public square, like in this image uh, in St. Louis with our old courthouse. Sometimes it's in more private spaces like a neighborhood. Uh, and we'll go through a few examples that show uh, some, some of these. So in this particular case, uh, with working as an organizer with Artivist STL, we went out, my team and I went out into the middle of the night to uh, raise attention in the suburbs about some of the uh, protests, some of the racial issues, some of the uh, challenges that were going on in St. Louis. And using the same type of iconography that tells you to uh, stop at a stop sign or a red light, we started to paint uh, other messages overnight into all of these spaces. Now, of course, this was temporary, uh, but for anyone passing by, biking or running, they at least were met with these messages, these calls to action, so that they, they couldn't avert their eyes to what was happening, even though they lived in a more secluded place than, say, our urban uh, central corridors. And in the same vein, uh, we wanted to be able to tell the stories of people in a different light than what they were being seen as on the street uh, or by the media in the midst of all of these moments of protest. So my team and I created an initiative called uh, Faces of the Movement, where we took a lot of those protesters off the street, placed them into a studio, took photos and videos of them in order to allow them to share their own story in public space or, or back inside of public space. This is an example of Sunny. Uh, Sonny had been photographed, uh, you know, in this point of anguish with a lot of other people in, in the middle of Saint, downtown St. Louis. Uh, but when she, we brought her into space and we allowed her to pose how she wants to pose versus how uh, she was seen in, you know, the flash of a moment, she started to reflect on why she was there. And, you know, this was the, the image that, that resonated or that came to life. Sonny is actually now a model. That's, you know, a side, a side note, but... It's amazing how people saw that, that photo of her and that became so essential to her journey uh, moving forward. I would play these videos, um, but they're, you know, they're very quick. You don't necessarily have to listen to sound, but this just shows you a little bit of the behind the scene of what that studio experience looked like with being able to bring all of these uh, protesters and uh, organizers and leaders into a space and just let them talk and be themselves. And ask me again. And in these, in these moments, not only were we sharing stories, but people were building community with each other. Um, so many of the folks who were doing work back in 2014 are some of the same folks who have risen to become civic leaders, whether they run for office or they're now leading uh, local organizations, but so much of it started with sharing their, their stories. Another uh, way that this manifested was by bringing people together across different spaces, uh, largely public spaces, um, from our International Institute to our Regional Arts Commission, to outdoor uh, and public spaces, even to uh, some of our theaters. And being able to allow people to use uh, methods like playback theater and performing arts uh, in order to share their stories with each other and then develop uh, what we call video profiles that then allowed them to um, connect more of the dots between what was happening, what they were feeling, and what was possible for our region. And this is just another uh, video clip of some, of some of those moments. With this project in particular, it started in uh, the middle of Ferguson uh, on Canfield Drive where Michael Brown was murdered and uh, ventured over to 
where his, um, the, his, his local police uh, station was. And then that, this project spread to people taking video cameras themselves, working with uh, us and the, our local PBS station um, in order to turn these stories, these video profiles into pieces that can be uh, shown night after night and day after day in our public media commons. And that became a way of tying in older audiences to hear these stories, uh, other people to take action if they were coming into our you know, Grand Center Arts Theater where this media commons was. Uh, finding those different ways of connecting people to story, using art, using video, using design. But this wasn't just it. It wasn't just about connection. We wanted to make sure that art and storytelling could really start to fuel into uh, the policy and systemic work that was uh, necessary for our region to heal from uh, what was going on in Ferguson. And as a, a board member of Ford through Ferguson, um, I got to work with a lot of storytellers in order to ensure that um, the data, the research, the policies that we were recommending, the 189 calls to action that we created as a region were embedded in the true lives and lived experiences of everyone in our, in our region. But that's not it. Because sometimes we don't necessarily have the words to tell the story. Sometimes the story has to be visual. And the mirror casket was definitely one of those visual voices uh, where it wasn't necessarily about uh, just the ways that we interact and communicate with each other, but the ways that we see each other. This casket was one that came to me in uh, a series of nightmares uh, when I was on the ground in Ferguson. And I'm, I'm not a sculptor, um, so I couldn't shake the idea, but I knew that I couldn't create it myself. And so I called up as many artists as I could in order to get support with this. And these six artists uh, came aboard to, to help me create this. And once it was launched, we were intentional about the design of it, making sure that the sides were all clear so that for the people who were marching it through the streets, they could see themselves clearly and perhaps empathize with the plight of people who had been slain by extrajudicial uh, police and state violence, and maybe have a sense of empathy with those, uh, with those experiences, those murders, those, those deaths. But for so many people who saw it and were targeted with this mirror casket, the front of it was intentionally cracked so that you get a distorted view of self, uh, namely when, in this uh, image, when it's pointed towards some of the officers who were uh, involved in the Ferguson Police Department at that time. And when you look into this cracked surface of it, the point is not to just see yourself. It is the question why you don't see yourself clearly. And perhaps think about why is it, who is it that we've become in the midst of constantly sparring against each other, killing each other, and not seeing each other's humanity and dignity. This casket had a profound uh, impact on our movement and on our region. And it started to expand across the nation uh, through tours, uh, but also through the writings of various historians and authors. Uh, Smithsonian Magazine uh, published a, a spread about the mirror casket when it opened its um, National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2016. And the activist who wrote about the mirror casket was Angela Davis. And she titled her article, The Art of Protest. I'm gonna come back to this because this title has definitely changed my life and my engagement with her has fueled so much of uh, the work that I do now. But this casket was ultimately collected by, purchased and collected by uh, the Smithsonian for uh, what I like to call the Blacksonian. Uh, and we use the funding to fuel back into a lot of the artivist works and creations that we created. Uh, over 80 have been created, you know, between 2014 and 2018, uh, during the time that all of this collection was happening. 
But at the same time, I was working at a museum myself. I was serving at the Contemporary Art Museum in our city. And while all of that awesomeness was happening in my life, I was also sparring it off with uh, more artists and our institution at large because of an exhibit that uh, painted or portrayed the images of Black people in quite harmful ways, distasteful ways, uh, smearing toothpaste on the image of a Black woman's body, uh, smearing white chocolate and dark chocolate as gunshots and splatter, uh, blood splatter on archival images uh, from the civil rights movement. And the artist and the curator themselves not seeing how poorly timed and distasteful this was for a region that was still uh, mourning, the, you know, in, in wrestling um, with all of the, the struggle that was the Ferguson uprising. I ended up writing a lot during this time period and ended up publishing uh, a letter to the directors in Hyperallergic Magazine um, calling for the resignation of our curator, but also calling for essential changes within the museum. And this in many ways became my catalyst for writing even more. During this time period, I uh, had been writing on these sticky notes uh, to myself. I had a project, a daily project where I just wrote a note every day. And when we were protesting at this uh, museum, so much of those notes had become videos, uh, they had been featured in exhibits. Uh, people were utilizing them in workshops with children and youth in order to teach them about mindfulness and ad advocacy. Uh, but when this happened, our museum was silent. And sticky notes, of all things, became one of the interchanges between local artists who were protesting and boycotting the museum to be able to have an exchange with the curator because he wouldn't show up at public events. And the power of writing, the power of questioning and checking in with oneself uh, is something that has continued uh, with me, allowing me to, uh, to write policy uh, for arts and culture across our region and think about racial equity across the region, but also be a contributor to the American Ethnologist um, series, which dedicated a whole volume uh, recently to uh, activism and arts activism in, in particular. And like I said, that title, The Art of Protest, came back around in my life. In 2018, I was asked to give a TED talk of the same name to talk about the Mirror Casket Project. And uh, while I was at Harvard this past semester or this past school year, uh, as a fellow, uh, a company, a publisher reached out to me to say, hey, we saw your TED talk. We've been thinking about uh, publishing a book called The Art of Protest for young adults, for youth. Uh, would you be the author? Now, initially, I wasn't really that interested because I thought it was a joke and I, I couldn't take it seriously, but they were serious. And I've now written uh, or completed the writing of my first book. And it's become this full circle moment where not only is it about my voice, but the visual voices of artists all across the world, working with people in Romania, in London and other parts of the UK to create this larger narrative about how art can be a source for change across the world, especially in the midst of social resistance and uh, social movements and uprisings. And here are just a few spreads of the progress so far. But creative writing as an art form is not the only thing that I've been up to. I wanna share a few more projects um, that take us into a larger scale uh, on, on a regional level a little bit. Because during the same time, I started to question public space and the power of art within the built environment and how might we create more spaces that honor dignity and human life and humanity and also heal the divisions in a, a region like St. Louis that's hyper-segregated. One of those ways was through food. 
and by working with uh, local doctors actually to transform one of our uh, public transportation buses into um, a local and mobile farmer's market. And at the same time, host a series of conversations called Food Spark that brought people together over potluck dinner parties in order to talk about these hard taboo issues that are so divisive within our communities. Since 20, what, 14, we've hosted over 40 uh, different monthly uh, potlucks, welcoming and ushering and engaging in conversation with over 4,000 people across the region. And here are just some images of some of the bus wraps of, of that design, of the, the first bus that we co-created and the ways in which people can navigate within it, and the ways in which we gutted it out in order to ensure that farmers, as many farmers as possible that we could work with, um, could sell their produce and feed people in our community who were living in uh, areas that were um, suffering a, what's called a, a food apartheid. Many people know these spaces as food deserts. The other scale, scale of in some of this work was that because of all of the attention that um, as an artist, I was giving to looking at public space and the ways we navigate and understand each other. Uh, I was welcomed to be a part of the development of um, one of the largest greenway and landscape architecture projects in our city, in our region. And it's the Brick Line Greenway, formerly the Shoto Greenway. And this greenway would stretch once it's completed uh, from Forest Park, which is our, our largest park in, in the city, uh, which is on the west side of the city, right at the borderline of the city and the county. This greenway would stretch west to east to the St. Louis Arch. But we got this opportunity through a competition. And part of what allowed our team to win this competition was that we were not just interested in connecting, you know, this zipper, this loop, of uh, the city east and west, but really looking north to south across our major dividing line, which is the Del Mar Divide or the Del Mar Boulevard Loop, and then connecting two of our other parks, one that is beloved in one of the most diverse neighborhoods in our community, and one that has uh, been more neglected and has been a site of uprest itself uh, in one of our poorest communities. And part of my, my role on this team outside of serving as a design strategist was to think about the ways in which we could bring people together across these dividing lines using experiences like Food Spark, using uh, spaces like the St. Louis Metro Market, uh, and finding solutions like storytelling or through storytelling that allowed people to loosen some of their fears about crossing the line to the other side and experiencing different parts of our city, crossing those lines of segregation. And these are just a few more shots of some of the ways that we're envisioning this. This site in particular is the Griot Museum, which was the focus of my uh, Loeb Fellowship. And it's on the, the north side of our city a few blocks north of what used to be the pruitt Igo public housing uh, structures or apartments that were imploded uh, decades ago. And as that land is now being redeveloped into our National Geospatial Agency, um, the museum itself, the only you know, major Black history museum in, in, in our city, is being threatened uh, with the possibility of closing its doors and not being able to live out its, its, its beautiful mission of being a space, uh, a center, a hub for learning about Black history culture and celebrating that in our region. And by tying in the Greenway with this investigation into the capacity of, of the museum, part of my role with the Greenway now 
is thinking about the ways in which we can connect the dots even more across cultural institutions in order to allow people the, uh, the access or the ease to cross the line in other ways. Um, and as, you know, as I'm working on all of these efforts, I would be, miss, I would be remiss not to share um, some of the other things that have been keeping me steady in the midst of this collective work. Part of it is my leadership uh, as an organizer of a national effort called Designist Protests. After the murder of uh, George Floyd in, in May, in June, we started this effort in June. Um, there were about 3000 designers from all across the nation who joined us for a national call to talk about how we as designers can be a part of positive change moving forward and ensuring that uh, design justice is in live and is or alive uh, and, and actualized within the built environment of our cities. Thinking about our roles, the ways in which we have been uh, utilizing architecture, planning, design, et cetera, as tools of oppression, but also the ways in which we can use these same tools uh, to exert a radical vision for what racial and cultural and social justice might look like and what healing might look like. In addition to that, I'm also uh, teaching a course right now called Designing With by For Joy through Stanford's D School. And this is an investigation of what does it look like to use joy as our catalyst, use joy as our, our point of designing against social change. How does joy become uh, a, a moment or an experience of resistance? And how do we unveil and embody everything that our, our broken systems want us to suppress and let that live? our hopes, our dreams, how do we let that out and keep that at the forefront, even as we go through and push through for all of these changes. But also with my love of writing, I've created a community called Deliberate and Unafraid that's inspired by uh, the queer poet activist, Audre Lorde, whose words uh, live within my spirit to this day. When she said uh, during her poem, A New Year's Day, I am deliberate and afraid of nothing. I believe in the power of building community, creative community, in order to address the social issues that, that we face. But I feel that in order to do this work for the long run and sustain our energy collectively, we can't just be exerting and expressing all the time. We have to replenish our spirits and our souls. And part of that is through what the content that we read, the content that we consume. And I want to make sure that the communities and the people that I'm working with in equipping ourselves to be deliberate and unafraid in the midst of uncertainty and crisis, that we're fueling ourselves with some, some good words, some good poems, but also insights that allow us to really wrestle with our, our sacred humanity that seem to be lost. There are a few ways that um, you can engage with me in, in some of this content. One is through my, my YouTube page. Um, I, I create a lot of videos uh, talking about some of these issues. I read a, a lot of books, uh, a lot of children's books and, and poems on, on this channel, as well as uh, through Instagram, uh, just allowing creativity to inspire us, to motivate us and to fuel us. Um, I believe that art isn't just the visual. It is our holistic uh, way of express, expressing self. Uh, so please engage with me visually, engage with me through word, engage with me through voice, visual voice. And just as a shameless plug, next Tuesday is World Interaction Design Day. You can engage with me as I work with or listen to um, designers all across the nation, I'm sorry, all across the world um, to talk about these big issues. How do we sustain healthy culture? How do we fight against climate change? 
how do we wrestle with the issues of injustice that are in between that perhaps prevent us from uh, having healthy culture and climate. Please stay connected. And I look forward to having more conversation with you as we uh, continue with this. Thank you. Hello, Becca. Hello. Thank you. Yeah. That was fantastic. That was great. Um, and I think right now we're going to, I'll ask Dee a question, but if anyone uh, out there has questions, um, as David said in the beginning, you can um, type, them, type them in the chat. You can type them in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, you can raise your hand. And um, David's back there somewhere behind the curtain. And uh, he'll, field, he'll field the questions as they come in. So please start, start queuing up. So Dee, I am really, you know, your work is um, amazing. And you work with a lot of different people and a lot of different groups. You know, and I, I don't know if this started with the collaborative, uh, the group of people that helped you with uh, Realize Mirror Casket in 2014. But then, you know, there's a, there are your design partners with uh, uh, at, um, Civic Creatives. Um, and then your collaborators, you just mentioned Design as Protest. Um, and then most recently, Madad, um, which has two of, the, two of your uh, partners from Mirror Casket. Um, uh, so, and your reading group, and, 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 and. So this is just a crazy amount of like organizing and networking, but you seem to thrive in that. Like that seems to be the way you operate. And I guess coming from a, like sort of a design and social work background, that makes sense. But can, I guess two things, like one, can you talk about navigating all of those different groups of people and projects? And then oh, how's that doing during a pandemic? Yeah, I can talk through all of that. So okay, great. You're, you're spot on. Um, working in community for me is is big, um, and collaboratively uh, is is crucial. Um, honestly, part of it is like knowing what I'm good at and doing my best at that, and welcoming other people to exert their expertise, their skills, flex their skills and chops um, and, and amplify that through what we create uh, together. And as much as I love being an artist, I'm not always the most confident uh, with my own skills. When I'm on a client project, it gives me so much anxiety to uh, be pushing pixels and vectors across the screen or coding something. Um, but what I thrive on, what energizes and fuels me is the delegation, the figuring out the big piece, the big pieces of the pizza, oh, sorry, not the pizza, the puzzle, <laughs> although maybe pizza too. Um, but my mind works so well in systems, seeing the system, seeing the process and helping everyone navigate through it. Um, where to the point where I've toggled being an organizer and being a project manager on a lot of creative uh, teams. With the work that we're doing right now, I'm, I'm flexing all of those muscles. I'm designing, I'm back to designing things, which is fun. Um, I don't like to do it all the time, but when I do it, it's, it's funner uh, these days. But working with people in the midst of this pandemic and virtually, um, it has been something that I didn't expect to find as much ease with as I do, uh, because right now we have so many tools and platforms that allow us to flow in and out of conversation with each other and uh, check on the progress uh, where everyone is on the same document and we're responding in real time, even though we're physically uh, apart. I'm currently a part of what, three? Yeah, three collectives, um, Mad Dad, uh, design is protest and still art of his STL. And with all of those works, um, what I appreciate is that we have shared commonality of how we want to work together. Uh, we have documents that say, here are our norms. Uh, here are you know the ways that we're gonna hold each other accountable. Here's our, our checkpoints, all of that. 
And one of the things that stand out to me most is this mantra of low ego, high impact. And by not instilling so much of my ego or our egos into our process, uh, I think that's how we're able to get so much done with such a large group of people. That's great. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah. David, do we have some uh, there questions? Are, there are several questions in the chat, or uh, sorry, in the Q and A. Um, if anybody would like to uh, ask a question, go ahead and, and raise your hand if you'd like to speak your question. Um, otherwise, we'll we'll speak them for you. But um, there are a couple questions about um, things that students could do as small acts of activism. Um, or maybe ways to uh, begin to get involved or crack the surface, mm -hmm. so to speak? Okay. Um, so with students in particular, especially students who are designers, whether you're graphic designers, UI, UX, architects, et cetera, um, of course, I'm going to be selfish and say join Designers Protest, join the, the collective. Um, mainly because we have a lot of student organizers who are doing work at their own institutions to ensure that their learning experience is allowing them to learn more about uh, these intersections of design and social issues. Um, and hearing from voices that are not just in textbooks, uh, hearing from community members them themselves or finding other ways of, of learning beyond uh, the written word uh, through the making, through the co-creation process. Um, that would be one thing. Because we are in a digital uh, era of life, my biggest thing, and a few years ago, this used to be contested. Everyone hated the notion of creating things online. Uh, because it was considered as a point of slacktivism. But right now, because we are, you all are digital natives uh, and we're in this digital era, my biggest uh, thing to you is to put your content out there. Um, create a, a poster that encourages people to vote. Uh, raise your voice about something that you care about. Um, share that on, on Instagram and, and Twitter and your platforms, uh, create a podcast, like have those conversations uh, across the vibes. Talk to the people who don't share your opinion. Uh, it's hard, I, I can guarantee you it's very hard to talk to people who are on the other side of the spectrum of your values, but opening the conversation is one step. It's not the only step, but it is a crucial step for us getting to a point where we are taking collective action. And that would be my encouragement to you. Start at home, uh, start where you are and do what you can. Virginia, would you like to ask your question? Hello. Sure, Heidi, thank you. Um, I, I, I did share in my question, like a shout out to a Hale County connection. I studied in Alabama, so. I have friends and colleagues who have worked in Hale County. Um, and I loved sort of the breadth of your work and social engagement. So I have one question, I'm gonna read it. Okay. Um, your practice is centered around the built environment and humanity and addresses the politicization of built space. What are your thoughts on the politicization of natural space and humanity's entwinement with nature? Do we have a responsibility as designers to address this, um, particularly in thinking about like land and natural production and also like your work with farming and agriculture, like must we address this or are we like so far beyond that, <laughs> that we exist only in a built space? I'm just curious about your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, my short answer is yes we should be caring about this. Uh, we should be caring about our land. Uh, perhaps you're not going to be like a, a client, ex I mean, a climate expert, uh, but on a local scale, we should all be caring about what's happening within our, um, our communities uh, as it relates to the land. With, so with Designers Protest, one thing that I did not share is that there are nine demands that um, ground our work. One of those uh, demands focuses on the extraction and exploitation 
of both mm-hmm. land and labor. And I think the two go hand in hand, that the ways that we as humans have abused the land, uh, when we think about even you know the pipeline that's, uh, that was slated to go through Native American reservations, uh, when we think about in, in my city in, in St. Louis, how there's um, this underground inferno, uh, like dumpster fire uh, that's burning in part of our region in the rural areas. Uh, When we think about uh, how Flint, Michigan still doesn't have clean water, um, the ways in which we have um, overworked our land in many ways, the ways in which we we have um, destroyed um, ecosystems through uh, the building of urban uh, corridors and in cities. Um, I, I think we as humans are going to continue to to pay for for those abuses. And so I you know we can't necessarily reverse a lot of the damage that has already been done. Uh, but I believe in the power of us as designers to help our cities, help our you know local companies uh, and even corporations, find uh, healthier ways of uh, innovating within our our spaces with doing less harm to our natural environments. Uh, Because we're we're seeing it, uh, you know, most, so much of California is on fire and uh, there there are reasons for that. Um, So I, yeah, I think we have to show a little bit more TLC to, to the land. Well, uh, yes. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Jessica, would you like to ask your question? Oh, I guess she disappeared. I'll, I'll grab a question from the uh, Q&A. Um, there was a question about uh, preserving uh, protesters' anonymity. Um, let's see. Um, uh, I know recently for many of the BLM protests, people were requesting for their faces to not be shown because uh, there were cases where they were tracked down afterwards and targeted. Were there some people that you were able to keep anonymous? This is in reference to your um, to, the, to the protesters sharing. Yeah. yeah, so with that project, everyone opted. There were a lot of people who did not want their faces uh, shared and shown. And it was very much a, a real uh, experience that uh, not only were people targeted and tracked, uh, but many folks were, um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the word, um, st- like stalked. Uh, by, they were, they were being watched uh, in, in real time. Um, and some people, as you might have read in a few articles over the last few years, there have been some protesters from uh, the uprising in Ferguson who've all been killed or who, who all died in the same way. Um, point blank bullet to the head, burned up in a car. And, um, we have to look at those those patterns of how exposure can actually put lives more in danger. And I, I think right now there's higher sensitivity to it than there was uh, back in 2014. Um, I, I think, and so I'm gonna, that's my answer to your question, but I'm gonna deviate a little bit. I, I think one of the, challenges that has happened over the years is this tension between folks who are doing or who are doing activism work to become famous to become like the next Duray McKesson or the next Brittany Packnett um, and the folks who don't necessarily have the protection of ec- like educational privilege when they are exposed. There are some people on a class level who might not be able to be in all the photos because when they're targeted, it's not someone asking them to to speak at a conference or to win 
a Webby Award or a BT Award or anything like that, or be on MSNBC. It's people who are coming uh, at them on a more local level and in a more dangerous uh, way. And so we do have to tend to that tension as well, uh, not just in terms of the police tracking your phone or you know they have your license plate and tracking you in a city, but also um, your neighbors and your residents too. If, if I were to start that project back, Faces of the Movement, I likely would not make it faces of the movement. I would make it voices of the movement and keep it anonymous. Uh, Miriam, would you like to ask your question? Yes, hello. <laughs> So just very quickly, maybe this is a personal thing, but um, you said to think low ego, high impact whenever you go through um, creating, right? And uh, making things happen. So, but then I was start thinking, do you ever, since, I mean, it seems like you have um, this way of making dreams into reality. And if you get stuck, you have connections, but did you ever get into that mindset of I am in over my head, I'm, this is too big maybe, or, you know, you know, what am I doing? I'm getting all these people involved and I'm actually kind of stuck, you know? Um, I hope this makes sense, but how do you move past that? Um, I'm, I'm sure you reach out for connections and ask for expertise, but, you know, it, you, you have to be okay with asking for help too, right? Or I don't know, just how do you move on with it? Yeah, my gosh. Um, so I feel that way right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I may not have a solution, but some, some things that have been helping me. I, I definitely feel like I'm in over my head with a few things at the moment. Um, for example, when we started Designers Protest in June, for our first national call, I, it was my assumption that we were just doing a call. Like we were just gonna talk. Uh, this now led into this multimodal um, series of platforms and teams and committees, uh, all volunteer led. So we can't you know, ask people to overexert. Um, and I wasn't expecting to, co-lead something this massive uh, in the middle of a pandemic. I was actually happy when I got sent home from Cambridge, from, from Harvard, uh, <laughs> uh, because when it was during spring break and I came back home to Memphis to be with my family. And my plan, my vision was that I was gonna finish writing my book because I had a July deadline. And then I was gonna just rest for the, the rest of the year and maybe like travel because I, I didn't have like that, that sense of like financial worry or need and I can work from anywhere. And with getting in, into this uh, and some other things that have emerged uh, since March, my goodness, I, I'm realizing the power of no. Um, and my coach, my, my professional coach, she taught me, you know, the three criteria for yes. Um, and I, I would challenge this to, to you all who feel like you're in over your heads with, with some things right now, right? Be strict, right? Three things that are required and fundamental for you to say yes to an opportunity that come your way. Um, I'll, I'll post the link to my, my three because I can't re remember off the top of my head what I, what I said, but I, I made a YouTube video about it. But, I think mine was like, does it fuel me? Does it stretch my creativity? Do, do I have the capacity to, to commit uh, full term? And if I can't say yes to all three of those, then I say no. I was doing well until we started Designers Protest. I was saying no and slinging them left and right joyfully. But when this happened, um, not only did we find ourselves organizing a team of over 150 uh, BIPOC designers, uh, and by BIPOC, I mean Black, Indigenous, and folks who identify as people of color. Um, 
But we also started receiving a lot of adjacent opportunities to be on podcasts and to give talks and uh, to consult, uh, you know, design agencies with their work. And those are the things that I've realized that I have to say no more to so that I can really be grounded in this work. And so creating those barriers um, has become a crucial uh, thing for me, but I definitely don't get it perfect or get it right every time, that's for sure. I'm wondering if, uh, see, Kat Davila, if you do, you, you've had a question, would you like to speak yours? Yes. Um, I, um, I grew up in North St. Louis and uh, growing up there in the 70s and 80s, I very much saw that divide before moving down here to St. Louis. What neighborhood? I mean, moving down here to Houston, rather. Come again? What neighborhood? Um, off of Colt, really, um, off of King's Highway and Martin Luther King. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so when coming into a community, you know, they may be distrusting, you know, and wondering what your intentions are not being from that community. So um, if, and then I apologize if you've already touched on this, but if you can explain to me the process in which, you um, you would use to engage with this community because this can be replicated anywhere in communities of need. And so what's the process of engaging with the community and um, understanding what they may need from you and how you can help? Yeah, so to be honest with you, it's, it's not really a, a process it's more like the question from in my head is not often what's our process for engaging, it's what's our relationship for engaging. Uh, do we have existing um, friends, connections, uh, folks who are not just on the project team, but really in, in the community, on the ground as a resident or you know in some other gatekeeping stakeholder way. Um, and primarily, I was trained as a community artist uh, through RAC, through the Regional Arts Commission in St. Louis. And that's when my practice really started to become invitation only. So I, I don't often pursue uh, design competitions or RFPs uh, for work, uh, especially when they have a community component to them. Um, and oftentimes I'm serving as a community engagement specialist on uh, some of these teams. And for me to join in, I got to know somebody more than who's, you know, in a transactional relationship with me. Um, that sense of connectivity uh, is, is very critical to me. And so I, I can't say that I have a process because I don't necessarily join projects where I'm not already connected or already invited or welcome to be there. Okay. And to, to that point as well, there is a primer uh, by the Center for, I think it's, yeah, the Center for Urban Pedagogy, uh, CUP. Um, I think their website is welcometocup.org and, or wearecup.org, one of those. They have this primer called um, The Story of Rick and Dick. And it gets to ex exactly what you're talking about. What tends to happen in the process when someone, a designer is working with uh, or working for a community versus working with them to co-design uh, whatever it is that they're working on. And part of the outcome is that you have this glossy, you know, shiny, amazing thing that's winning awards, but it's not being utilized. It's not being, uh, it doesn't have a sense of ownership or it fades away once you leave the project. And that was something that, you know, for me, I don't wanna just do work to do work. Um, I, I wanted to have a, a lasting impact. And so that was uh, critical for me, where if we end the project, perhaps it fuels into something else because somebody else involved takes it over and really has the passion and fervor to lead it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Kat. Cheryl, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, hi, thank you uh, very much. I, 
I see a, a, a big range between work that is kind of in the streets, uh, part of the protest, non-sanctioned, um, just out there. And then uh, some of the other work, I know you have to go and jump through lots of hoops in terms of putting in proposals, getting approval, uh, funding, all those kinds of things. Um, so I guess in, in a couple, could you elaborate a little bit? Do you feel one that your, your, your connection and you're getting the message out there, is it stronger on the streets or, um, you know, is it stronger the other way? And, you know, one place I, I think about it is like the park, the, the, the park in um, St. Louis where, you know, on the one hand, it, that has to have just so many hands in that pie um, that it becomes probably pretty challenging to kind of get out what you want to get out. Um, so is there, do you have a preference? Is, yeah, I, I definitely prefer to just do the work with the people uh, because you're right. Uh, there are, there are a lot of, in order to uh, actualize projects like the Greenway, um, and there are a lot of teams uh, that are part of it. I, I believe there at one point, there were about 20 teams working on this one project and we were, we would come energy, but of community-based work and the fidelity, like the quality of the work that is being expected versus having a big name on a ticket with, you know, a million dollar shiny idea and wrestling through that, um, you know, it's, it's a space of comfort for me, actually, like having those discussions and those debates and making the case for um, why we should be pulling in more community members versus uh, national brand a branding agents, you know, where the dollars and stuff go. Um, so those negotiations happen. I actually enjoy that work. Uh, when it comes to policy, you know, working with a city uh, to, to make things happen is is hard in this in the sense that at least in our region there are multiple developments happening all at once and so in terms of feasibility there might be uh parts of it that are interior towards this other area and that isn't always fair and so i yeah i definitely enjoy i find more pleasure with uh personal pleasure with being on the community side of creating projects and, and co like co-conspirating um, versus being on a huge or enough local voices. And I, you know, disrupted one of their dinners to tell, tell my, my side of why this was wrong. And one of the teams was very earnest and genuine about wanting to do this right. And so they scrapped their initial uh, finalist proposal brought in me and some others. And like I said, we won that competition. Um, so yeah, it's, there are, I have a lot of thoughts on it, as you can see. This is a good follow-up question. Um, what is one of the biggest challenges you've faced as the only or one of the only designer, uh, designer design strategists in an, in, on an interdisciplinary team? Hmm. In the case where I'm the like the only designer or design strategist, um, actually, many of the projects that I shared weren't necessarily always the case. Like there were usually a few other people who were also designers. Uh, but one project that I did not talk about was um, our regional branding system that we did with uh, the Missouri Coalition for the Environment, with working with regional farmers um, and residents of North St. Louis, being the only designer in the room was so hard because I had to catch myself a lot from using uh, jar like design jargon and language that they did not understand uh, and really break things down. And so for me, I've always been humbled um, or like not humbled in the way of like, oh, I'm so humbled. Like, I've been brought to my knees in humility uh, in those spaces because there's always someone who's gonna call out BS, which I appreciate. Um, and it makes us get out, or it makes me get out of my head and really 
think about the work, the, the essentials of the work and not just the design part. Um, and so I, I think it transitions more into the strategy side versus design in the ways in which we could creatively problem solve this. Looks like uh, Jennifer Barker's had her hand up for some time. Jennifer, you wanna ask a question? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so as um, a white artist, I know my ancestry well. I know that my family is a long line of Southern families. I know that some of my ancestors fought uh, as Confederate soldiers. Um, I think I've just become more and more overwhelmed by just the weight of, uh, I, I'm not just tackling my own biases every day. I'm, I'm trying my very best to do the work of, you know, challenging my own bi implicit bias and um, different ways that I can be active in unraveling this mess. Um, but I feel like I'm also bearing the burden of the sins of my ancestors. And I care about uh, activist art, but I think seeing and hearing so many different ways that white artists have done it wrong in a sense of appropriated or taken up the space of minorities. Um, I guess the core of my question is what advice would you have to uh, a white artist that cares about justice, is interested in activism, but is just overwhelmed by all of the different things I need to be sensitive of to make sure that I'm not doing doing something wrong, I guess. Uh, that's a simple way of saying it, but. Yeah. I mean, I thank you for that question. Um, I think so much about it is with regard of who's in your support system. Um, do you have the people around you? And I, I mean, like, do you have black and brown folks in your life close to you uh, who, who trust you and who you trust? So it's a reciprocated uh, relationship to where you, you you can find that sense of balance when it comes to the work of not centering self over those who've been most affected by the issues that you're collect that we are collectively uh, facing. I, I think that is so such a crucial part of it because many times when we're seeing white artists, white designers who are messing it up, uh, it sometimes is 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 in isolation of the movement itself. I, I think when we're in community, we know those cues, we know those whatnots, and it kind of makes it a little bit uh, easier. And I'm, I'm thinking particularly of like my team with the, the Mirror Casket Project, Marcus and Sophie in particular. Uh, Sophie, um, who's, she's actually a white Jewish woman. Um, she, she's like someone who has put her body physically on the line um, and gotten arrested uh, in, in protests so that I, I and other Black folks didn't have to. And part of it was recognizing that she has the privilege to where she, she can be arrested and released you know, within the next hour, whereas uh, others might have additional charges or you know, be charged at large. And when it came to creative practice, there were key sets of skills that uh, she identified herself as having and wanting to contribute and us saying like, yes, like, please, let's, let's do this work. Uh, like, it wasn't this sense of I'm an ally to your struggle. For her, it was, I'm a comrade. I'm a co-conspirator. Like, your struggle is my struggle because I, I know, my family knows what it's like to uh, be targeted with violence and hatred. When it comes to white Americans who have, you know, the legacy and the history of uh, a, a lot of stuff, <laughs> uh, 
a lot of stuff that perhaps needs to be unraveled. Um, I, I think it, it starts at home. Uh, it does, I think you're on the right track in sharing that you're learning your biases, your implicit and complicit biases, but what are, you know, what are you feeling into yourself and how is that manifesting in the ways that you show up in community with other people, uh, even in public space? Uh, are you exerting voice to uh, call out family members or call in, I should, I should say, maybe not call out, but call in family members to uh, understand why uh, decentralizing white supremacy is important. Uh, why uh, decentralizing uh, the patriarchy is important so that there is more harmony and more dignity that all of us can start to see manifest in, in our lives because my struggle is your struggle. And I, I think, I, I'm rambling now, but I, I think like those are some, some critical uh, ways of being. And I, I don't have the an all the answers because I don't know, you know, your full story. I don't, you know, we, I'm sure if we sat down and talked, we can come up with so many uh, ways of thinking about this, but those two points would be my, my main ones. Thank you. Yeah. Samiria, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Hey Dee, thanks for coming. I'm so excited. Yeah. This is such a great talk. I'm so excited to see your work. Oh, I can't wait until tomorrow. But um, <laughs> so I, I was really excited to hear you speak and um, just see how many connections and ways that I can connect with you and your work, especially me being from Alabama, from the South, born in Montgomery, and then also graduating with, from an undergrad with, at an HBCU you know, one of my biggest fears is going through what, you know, you went through and heard that comment of like, oh, you should know better. Mm -hmm. So like, even now in my studio, I know I was talking to, you know, our professor about like, wow, I just don't want to offend anybody. I want to make sure I do anything gracefully. So um, I know you said before you kind of don't have a process, but you like to go in to places that you, you know, that you know someone, but is there a way that you find yourself more disconnected from your work now or do you still find yourself kind of you know I don't know is it more of just the community now or do you find yourself you know still in some way connected does that make any sense yeah I mean there there's a lot of disconnection to to be honest um one being that I'm in Memphis and so many of my partners are in St. Louis. And so, you know, even next weekend, I have to travel to see them. Whereas many of us used to live in the same neighborhood and I could bike over or walk over or take a, a shorter commute. Um, but without being in the day to day, without being able to hang out, uh, without being able to go to a coffee shop and see folks that I know, I feel that deeply and it does affect my creativity because sometimes I, this is you know one of my flaws, sometimes I can be like an out of sight, out of mind person. And with the internet, my mind is all over the place to where I get overwhelmed with all the people who I could be connecting with that I don't connect with anyone. And I, yeah, I, I think there are, you know, there are like three or four folks who they have, we have a text message relationship. So I don't have to see them online and we're constantly communicating. But for so many of the other folks that I work with, we're connecting on Slack, we're connecting on email, we're co connecting on Instagram and, and Twitter. And those aren't as personal. So it's not just like the physical disconnection, it's like an emotional uh, disconnection to where that sense of uh, really being in intimate space with each other is missing because we're doing it on all of these platforms and interfaces. Uh, the, the third disconnection that I'm feeling right now is between me and the work itself. Um, that sometimes I don't feel like 
thinking about the big, bold ideas. I just want to get through the day. I just want to write a sticky note. I just want to uh, brainstorm with some folks and not necessarily have to execute. There's a lot of emotional exhaustion that I feel and that so many others that I'm working with that they're feeling too because so much of what we're going through is so crushing and it's overwhelming and it's so uncertain that we don't know what the real solution is. Like I'm I'm emotional this week because of the verdict from from last night uh, or, or yesterday with Breonna Taylor that even as her face was on magazine covers and she was uh, mentioned in all the songs, uh, celebrities rose up and went to Louisville advocating for justice. All of this stuff happened, still no justice for someone who was shot in bed in her sleep. And when those types of moments happen, it can make, it can make me feel, I don't wanna speak for anyone else, it can make me feel this, this question of like, damn, what, what has to give, you know? Like, what can we actually do and create? Because we just keep getting the same results, even as we're trying different tactics. And as a designer, I have to believe that we can innovate and iterate uh, the ways that we approach this issue of injustice. But as a human, I'm, I'm at a point of giving up and throwing in the towel and going, you know, moving away to Johannesburg to live a life in bliss in South Africa, you know? Um, so there is that disconnection between me and the work right now because I, and it, even though I'm still doing it, like I'm still active on all of these projects and teams, there's a part of me that wonders if it will actually work. And I know that I'm not alone in, in that fear and that worry. Uh, but I, I do know that we have to stay, we have to stay the course. Like the song was saying when we first got on this chat or on this call, this, this webinar, <laughs> um, we, we can win as long as we keep our head to the sky. And for me lately is, where I have felt connection has been in the communities and in the things and people I have in my life that have helped me keep my head up versus putting my head down. And um, because of that, I do still have hope that we will win. You know, Dee, it, that, that makes me think, I think you said this, tell me if I'm wrong, but rest, healing and joy are forms of resistance yes. and healing is a cultural process. Yeah. And I, and I think that's really important to point out. And that goes along with your belief in physical and mental well being part of is, a, is foundational to social yeah. justice, creating social justice and doing the work, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I will say that the other side of that question in terms of where I feel connection is that these platforms have allowed me to connect with so many brilliant souls who I otherwise may not have been able to because in, in some ways the internet and social media in particular takes down the degrees of separation uh, between us. And I, I do feel a, a lot of hope that because we're doing this in community and we're, we're centering joy in the work and not allowing us to collectively defeat us in our, our spirits, that we can push through this and really come out with some brilliant stuff. Uh, probably, do we have another, what do you think, David? Yeah, maybe time for one more question. One more question. I, I feel like we're ending on such a good note, I, I almost hesitate to ask another question, <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll take a chance here. Uh, there was a question about um, how art and design is so heavily tied to the on to the online platform right now. I'm not sure if this is in reference to COVID or just the 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 kind of the the um, the evolution of of design and and the fact that it lives so prominently online. Um, but there's also uh, 
uh, the internet in general, platforms shadow banning, particularly activists, uh, uh, they're asking about the cons of 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 that of um, design being so heavily present yeah. online. And and I wonder if you want to if you could speak to kind of the flip side of that, and if you um, have thought about like UX or UI uh, um, strategies. Um, not just design, but but interface strategies mm -hmm. um, as, sub as subversive acts. Yeah. So for for the first part, uh, some of the the cons um, that we've experienced, of course, on a platform like this, Zoom bombing. Um, just last month, we hosted a national designers protest call, and twice we were Zoom bombed with someone who. Uh, was you know drawing phallic images uh, on the screen and uh, changing their name to attendees and writing heinous stuff in in the chat. Um, there were a, a few moments um, on Instagram where I felt like, am I being shadow banned because I'm posting uh, content that is more subversive? And I, I took it down, and it's it's amazing how you know, the algorithms uh, work when we are tweeting our face or posting our faces, um, people people love that. Like that shows to, to a lot more folks, uh, but more of the design graphics, like static content, that often isn't uh, getting as naturally or organically um, shown and pushed through the platform we literally have to tell people share this, share this, share this in order to get uh, get it out there. Um, so I, I think that like there are some things on the back end that I would love to see changed. On on the front end with you know the the UX UI, um, I, I wish these platforms were just designed, especially Zoom, uh, was designed better to look better. Uh, in, in the class that I teach about joy, just today we were talking about um, killjoys in, in UX design. Um, and most of the students said Zoom. And part of it is that you can't change the features of this thing. You're constantly looking at this black background that's around you know, the squares. You can't move them around and shift them. You only get two or three views uh, depending on if someone's sharing a screen or not. And what might it look like to have a more agile, you know, uh, or more modular um, interface with this thing? Why do I have to pop out the chat or Q&A or someone's face in order to minimize it, on, like minimize the screen? There are so many questions to, to, to all of this. Uh, same with platforms like uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I think part of what's happening with these is that they're trying to do everything and they're losing their essence. I get overwhelmed when I get on Facebook, whether that's through my desktop or my phone. And part of it is that I, I want a simple space, uh, a more simple uh, design that allows me to communicate what I'm communi communicating with the people that I know. And maybe if they share it, they, you know, the people that they know uh, will, will see it. I think simplicity will go a long way. And, and some color, like why, why is everything like just one color on these platforms? I wish, you know, Facebook was blue and red and green and not just blue. Um, but yeah, I can, I can rant all day about some of this stuff. Well, that's great. I think that's, that's taken us to 8.30. I think this has been a fantastic conversation. Great questions. Yeah, this has been great. And uh, you're great. You've been great. Uh, fabulous work. And uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. And I know you're going to spend some time with uh, some of the design students tomorrow. So I hope that really goes well. Mm -hmm. um, thank you again. And thanks to everybody who came out tonight or <laughs> sat at your computer night or pulled out your phone tonight and, and joined. Um, really great to have you. And check the events page on the School of Art for the next one, which is when, David? October what? 14th. October 14th. Same time, same place. I think. No, actually, that one's earlier, maybe. Yeah, it's 4, four o'clock. 4 yeah. o'clock. 
same place. So again, Dee, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all for thank having you. me. It's been yeah. a joy. Okay, great. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye.